Sup everybody, this is Carrick from ACG, and today I'm stoked to bring you the review for the Indiana Jones-styled smirking face murder simulator known as Uncharted 4 Thief's End for the PS4 and brought to you by Naughty Dog. Uncharted 3 left us with a Drake that was coming to grips with a dual life. His adventure-themed Ashley Madison profile was sort of exposed and left us at the end of that game knowing, at least in part, much more of what made up the man that both killed wantingly and without question in the seeking of ancient artifacts, but also who had married and failed. But Drake doesn't go quietly into that good night and somehow he's roped back into one more adventure a globe spanning story of swords skullduggery and characters with the shoulder strength of yoke to the gills mountain gorillas graphics are up first the Uncharted series has always been that digital location scout for a new version of Robin Leach's Lifestyles of the Rich and Infamous, traversing the globe in tales of treachery, but always really showing that the plucky thief may win in the end, but the bad guys have some pretty cool-ass cribs, even if they're a couple hundred years old. Using some amazingly detailed textures in a native 1080p picture, the game builds a landscape and it's a sight to behold, but there are three absolutely integral pieces to this game that trump the past titles. And the first and the one I noticed right away was the animation system which is almost mind-bogglingly complex and lifelike. While it was already excellent in Uncharted 3, in Uncharted 4 it's damn near insane. Even if Drake is slowly devolving into a madman constantly talking to himself almost non-stop in this adventure, it's the animations that tie into situation like that which add so much poignancy to what used to be just funny one-liners or questions of his current quality of life. It's the ticks when he talks, the small mannerisms in both gameplay and cutscene mixed with the larger more movie budget moments that makes these characters feel far more real and connected them organically with most of the game world. From the tired swoop of Drake's shoulders as he questions his place in the world while traversing a rain-soaked cliff in the middle of a monsoon, to the improved hand-to-hand -hand combat, and it lends this authentic feeling of controlling an actual person. For example, as Drake leaps into a jeep with completely different and lengthy animations for whichever side he enters, all of them playing with just enough briskness to not get on your nerves or make you think, man, Naughty Dog really just wanted me to see this. The next part to this, at least to me, is the more open-ended locations without any noticeable drop to the resolution depth or overall complexity of any of the normally expected locations in an Uncharted game, you basically get one part Indiana Jones, one part Expendables. As you're driving your Jeep through waist deep mud or using its winch to pull you up a hill that most mountain goats would go around, the ability to traverse is excellent and the open-ended spaces not only look amazing with very few issues cropping up, but feed directly into gameplay, including combat, which I'm going to discuss a little later. It's the first time that I can remember not looking up and down to see the future avenues of egress in an Uncharted title, but looking left and right as well. That spread has absolutely changed the way this game feels. Now the last part to this three-part section is the post-processing done to the picture. Without adding significant input delay, the post-processing anti-aliasing is almost impossibly good without any of the bog standard loss of detail that most anti-aliasing solutions on the consoles always seem to run afoul of. In many places, this is simply the best looking anti-aliasing I have seen on an image on a console game ever. Now what's great about all this is it combines during combat, which throws the whole level into a more destructible chaotic explosion of blood, man groans, and bullet slap than any of the prior titles. Weapon effects, explosions, showering particles off burning wreckage and burning people, and one of the coolest fire effects I've ever seen link all of this together. The overall graphics presentation is the culmination of all those layers and how they work with and against and for one another. There's a noticeable effort here to make everything as high presentation as possible, and that includes the almost insane amount of dynamic texturing and shading that goes on, painting the weary travelers a series of browns and gray from dirt, mud, and some poor dude's internals. While the I just got through hell look has always been a staple of these titles, this thing takes the cake. It is absolutely phenomenal. Excellent work. Now that doesn't mean that everything is perfect in the land of Oshuck's homicidal art thieves. There are a good number of low resolution textures hidden within the game and while their mixture and overall placement is done with every intent to disguise them, occasionally you're going to notice them. When Drake drops into an in-game real-time situation, some of the locations can actually look a bit worse for wear depending on where he is. Additionally, while the animation is top notch, by God does it screw up a lot. Listen, Drake's always treated the world as if it's his own version of Space Jam the prequel, ignoring gravity like it's just suggestion an old person makes when everyone asks what board game they should play. Sadly, the newer and sometimes more complex animations hammers some of this lunacy and inaccuracy home. I lost count the number of times that Nathan performed a role while hanging off the edge of a rock or danced in the air, finishing his animation before falling to his death. Swinging and rappelling is incredibly disjointed at times, with characters well below the apex of a swing with no chance of getting to the next ledge when suddenly they are sort of rocket boosted up into the sky just because the animation says you should be able to jump there. 
It's magic that lets you traverse some stunning scenery, but boy does it do so at the expense of the world feeling quite a bit broken at times. Now, it's easy to get dazzled by displays of some of the technical excellence going on here, but that's no reason to not discuss some of the issues as well. It's also no reason to assume that those dramatically impact the overall look of Uncharted 4, which happens to be the best looking game I think I've ever seen on console. Sound, music, and voice. <laughs> Jameson asked you about that Malaysia job again. Jameson always asked me about the Malaysia job. Look, Nate, I really think that you should take it. You know what? I don't want it. <laughs> hey, are you happy? Yeah, of course. You? <laughs> um... Um? <laughs> really? Yeah, we can deal with that when we get there. Look, that psycho would like nothing better than for you to show up. Plus, he's got Nadine and her whole army to back him up. Yeah, but he doesn't have this. The biggest pirate treasure of all time is within our grasp. I thought this was about saving Sam. It is. And sound is up first. First, bravo to a company that understands that sound is important to gamers. In fact, they really understand it with a multitude of choices, including speaker separation settings and all other kinds of things. Now, this allows for everyone from the person with just a TV to a person with a full-fledged home theater system to get the best sound they can get out of their available hardware. And isn't that what it's about? And that's good because for the most part, the sounds are actually excellent. Wind whips across the shark rops of a precipice with the barest of whispers. And you can hear the impact and additional sonic echo of a bullet as it slaps into a friggin' enemy shirt. There's also tremendous variation in weapons and explosions, and even movement sounds, something I discussed in my Witcher 3 review. That variability in understanding surface materials means that movement feels connected to the terrain via audio. Now this is something many studios do not even attempt, let alone perform this well. Very realistic. The only real complaint I think I have is that though the environmental effects are in place, many are a bit underpowered, and while this might be on purpose, when firing a firearm in a cave, let me tell you, it's nothing like it is here, and yes, I've done just that. It's like living in the center of a damn fireworks display. But other than that, I just have to say, really, really good sound. And of course, music is up next. Uh, it's pretty mediocre. You know, we know it's dynamic and that the experience is king here. Naughty Dog has stated that more than once. But when it's actually playing, I'm just not that interested in whatever is actually playing as a musical title. Battle music is fairly bog standard, quick paced stuff with some percussion thrown in and that fades to a middle tempo and then back to nothing after a battle. It's all dynamic and such, but it doesn't really seem to change or really make me feel a location. To be honest, I was really hoping for some native instruments mixed in as this is one of those games where the locations traveled could have really been places to stretch your musical wings. Now those times when full-fledged accompaniments are playing, it's okay, but listen, every Uncharted game has loved its string instruments and occasional hero journey tracks. Before just doesn't feel that different at all, and tracks even during the climatic moments felt almost cut and pasted from prior titles, or were just sort of what you expected. But for me, it didn't elevate the emotional moments of the game, which is what I expect from a musical score. And that, of course, brings us to voice. Now, while the Uncharted series has always met that benchmark for excellent voice, and depending on which of the sequels we're talking about and what year it was released, most of the time said it. It's Uncharted 4 and the side characters that actually nail it here and bring this up to a whole nother level. While Nathan Drake is suitably tired and questioning and always talking to himself like a man forgetting his meds, it's the characters like Elena Fisher and the nuanced and almost real portrayal of love, worry, and heartache and bad decisions that are handed out from her that lodge you into these people's lives. I mean, come on, Nate's a boy child continued, and despite settling down, the one thing that makes him enjoyable to watch is the part that makes him a train wreck of misguided decisions just waiting to happen. While Elena notices but rarely speaks about what she sees, animation portrays the notice, but it's the voice and the inflection that indicates worry. And let's be honest, she married a guy whose decision-making depth is probably about toppings on a sandwich, so this is gonna come up quite often. Troy Baker's excellent as Nathan's brother, a flawed man with a true love for a sibling, but an almost crushing mistake-making streak running down his back. To me, though, hands down again, Elena and Sully, who steals the show. Sully in particular, one part crazy young man caretaker, the other part family counselor, watching and hearing the little hints of his continual thoughts about the adventure coming out in this nuanced portrayal was actually spectacular. Now, he isn't in it as much as the others, but the subtleness in which that character plays out as both mentor and sometimes tell it like it is realist 
is shockingly good. Motion and event are both portrayed accurately, regardless if it's three men discussing their choices in a dirty hotel room after another setback, or the allowance that friends give one another to make mistakes despite everyone else seeing the future emotional car wreck that's going to happen right in front of them. Absolutely sets the bar for voice work this year. And of course that brings us to gameplay. First, a little bit about the story. Nathan Drake in Uncharted 4 is basically Murtaugh after the last Lethal Weapon movie, finally retiring after the previous three games' adventures and getting rid of the troublesome partners and lifestyle. Married to Elena Fisher, that on-again, off-again love interest that Nathan can't seem to stop putting into danger and leaving behind randomly. While the story breaks between backstories and prologues and current stories at a fairly regular pace, it's the first scene that they have as husband and wife that nailed the story for me and solidified the gameplay as we move forward. Nathan is a shell of his former self, and this is going to matter, so I'm going to cover this, even though it's in the gameplay section. You notice right away that gone is that infectious energy of a youthful man without connections in life, replaced now by a man in transition between being a walking man-child and a grown-up with the collected responsibilities that adult life sadly brings in the form of bills, co-workers, and the work it takes to keep someone else happy, especially when you have the emotional maturity of a Lego collection. And that's where the trouble begins almost instantly. You see, Nathan finds out that his brother, somebody he thought long dead, is alive and returns after more than a decade with a wicked hairline and a bag full of problems. What's Nate to do? I mean, it's his brother. Lip service portrayal of worry aside, Nate is already seen teeter-tottering over the stupid decision-making precipice anyway. And this really spry for a dead person brother of his easily pulls Nate into a journey that soon sees them searching for the lost pirate city of Libertania. Now, everybody seems to be really excited about this place because basically it's where all the pirates in the world said, yo, you know what? Let's shirk off all the fact that we hate one another and let's build a colony that's almost in all ways a mimic of the very groups and establishments we hate. Now, pirates were never very good long-term planners, that's for sure, but I assume it must have been like gathering 11 Scrooge McDucks all armed with flintlocks and bad eyesight and seeing if they could build a house. But in the end, here we are, and that's the gameplay you find yourself in. Now, while that gameplay for Uncharted sort of stays entrenched in the fairly linear path in which it's known for, one location after another, Naughty Dog has thrown a couple bones in for the next generation and also dialed down the set-piece moments a tremendous amount. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean less action, but it certainly means less of that bombastic action. First, when it comes to locations, while Naughty Dogs always love their verticality, stretching the limits of finger bone strength and the player's ability to ignore that almost inevitable butt clinching fear of heights, Uncharted 4 suddenly seem to have realized, holy crap, we can actually make the game wider as well. And locations are just much more varied on the horizontal plane, and though always leading inevitably to the same spot, it's that mini journey within the full journey that finally, to me, nails Uncharted perfectly. Listen, in many ways, past Uncharted's have been great, but they always felt like one of those circus tricks where someone balances spinning plates on sticks. You climb the stick, you have a small battle on top of a location that inevitably leads to a cutscene or a quick jump to another stick where you climb it and you get to another spinning plate plate, but it's never really given the player a larger plate. Sure, they looked amazing, but they were just plates. In many ways, that means stories upon what people were doing within the game levels didn't have as much variation as I would have personally liked. It always felt like we were always doing sort of the same thing, and the set pieces sort of felt the same way. Here, though, you're traveling bogs, large jungles with a dizzying array of available avenues of egress, exploring Scotland's hilariously dangerous untamed lands, and meandering across countless islands. The fact is that these locations are seamless within a massive world, absolutely solidifying that feeling that Uncharted's finally happening in one goddamn place. You have now have that exploration and journey within the larger story of the main adventure, and the addition to the gameplay allows that to be all connected, and it should not be discounted. Now, while exploring, you're going to have all kinds of items. One of them, of course, is the rope swing system you've probably heard about. You're quickly going to find yourself thanking those that came before you that they decided to wrap rope around logs all over islands, ruins, and ancient monasteries so that you have something to swing on because not only is it very, very basic to the gameplay, it's actually fun as hell. This is a good version of 3D Pitfall and your ability to both wall walk and swing around corners gracefully opens up all kinds of exploratory movement, but man does it open up combat. And that's when we talk about combat. While Drake continues to traipse around the world, boilishly tripping and looking foolish as he murder factories and entire nation's youth, it's the improved AI here that makes all this so much more satisfying than past endeavors. And combine that with the new way in which the locations are spread out horizontally, you have these massive battles with Drake leaping from cliffs, swinging around ledges, smashing people's dreams from the air, and then rolling behind some absolutely not safe to hide behind boxes and shooting someone in the face. And the control is still uncharted loose, but it's accurate enough that for the most part, you won't find yourself rolling 
into the wrong location once you get a handle on it. Now, the AI matches all that with its own flanking, pincering, vertical sense and descents, as well as an adherence to the old adage, shoot at whatever moves kind of mentality. The AI is basically disintegrating the physics-based cover system with hilarious aggressiveness. These guys just hate everything in the game world. I swear, if they were asked to move a box, there's a far higher chance someone would just shoot it to oblivion rather than bend over. It's awesome, it's kinetic, and best of all, it's fun as hell. And because the weapons control so well and have such a good punch, it means combat can feel all the more organic to the way the world pretends it is. Something that prior Uncharted's rubbed up against from time to time. But sometimes you gotta do it quiet. Quiet means sneaky, sneaky means stealth. And here is the addition of murder grass in Uncharted 4. That questionably strange foliage that seemingly crept across virtual worlds from Black Flag to Tomb Raider. It's basically a very unique looking grass that's longer than anything else and suddenly indicates that you can hide in it. Oh, and thank God most mansions, islands, ruined cities, and well, everywhere has people nice enough to plant large plantations worth of this stuff for you to hide in. While vehicle sections have been added, you're now taking control of a couple through your travels. The Slow sections really impress, but the higher octane moments can get noticeably troublesome as the control on the vehicles is frigging poor. It's still completely possible to get through those locations and still look pretty cool, but it would have looked far cooler had adequate control been given to the player. Now, multiplayer combat has also seen massive overhauls with a large number of items you purchase with cash you get from killing, punching, choking, and stealthing your way into enemy groups and then also killing them from behind. It's pretty much always about killing. They also added a new somewhat overpowered item that's called Mysticals, which is straight up magic sauce, like staffs that mark every opponent in teleportation. Yeah, I said that. It the real question is, even if it's a quicker 60 frames per second, how many are going to play this versus the single player? Hopefully, these add-ons cause that, because I actually think that the multiplayer here is really good, but I want to play it more. And next up is Fun Factor. It's a blast. You guys know me. Some of my favorite things are shooting people, blowing stuff up, and exploring massive locations. And this game lets me do it all, and there's also pirates. Because when not getting bone-riddling rickets, they were building the intricate clockwork-like mechanisms just to hide booty. So really, Uncharted 4 is a huge pirate chastity belt. Despite issues with the animation system and the occasional slowness in the end it was worth breaking into so as you guys know i rate games on a buy wait for a sale rent or never touch it again rating scale of course this is a buy it's well worth the money the game's fantastic it's got some slowness to it it is not perfect not even close to perfect but what is there is very very good and it doesn't fall into the typical sequel trap as i said which is bigger and better and louder instead it's actually more nuanced more subtle and more professional Go figure. So anyway, that's it for me. If you like the video, hit thumbs up. If you dislike the video, hit thumbs down. Maybe check out Reddit. Maybe check out Patreon. Maybe tell some people about us on your Twitter. What have you. As always, enjoy your week. Peace out.